Hi, this is Fizz30141, video 34. We now move to the final section of our course, uh, titled Other Sources of Radiation, and really this is a bit of a misnomer because the sources we will talk about are in fact the predominant sources of radiation which are used to provide high brightness and high intensity uh, uh, um, beams of photons for a large variety of scientific and technological purposes. So we'll begin by thinking uh, back to section two, where we derived Larmor's formula, which gave us the amount of power emitted by a charge Q as a function of time. And we saw that it depended on the square of the acceleration of that charge at some retarded time T primed. And in our derivation of the Hertzian dipole, we saw that the average power emitted was dependent upon the frequency with which the charge was moving and some distant scale over which it was moving and some amount of current. Okay, so we had the frequency of that charge motion and the amount of current uh, that comprised, that, that com uh, created that total amount of charge. And there was a factor of two that appeared, which was to do with the averaging over time, because sometimes the acceleration is large and sometimes the acceleration is smaller. Now let's look at another physical situation, which is that of the cyclotron. What is a cyclotron? A cyclotron consists of a magnet that provides a north pole and a south pole, such that there is a constant or near constant homogeneous magnetic field that passes between the north pole and the south pole. And I haven't uh, drawn the rest of this magnet uh, because other steel is required to uh, take um, the magnetic field when it exits the other side of those pole pieces uh, and to direct it back around and to form a complete magnetic circuit. I'm only really thinking of what's happening between the poles. And I imagine placing protons in some manner such that they are circulating with some velocity v perpendicular to that field. These protons can naturally arise uh, if I have some form of ion source in the center of the cyclotron, and by providing a suitable acceleration voltage, I can accelerate those uh, protons to a large velocity. Now, the force that acts upon any charge is given by the Lorentz force due to the electric and magnetic fields. And of course, we're considering here there is no electric field. And here the force is perpendicular to the magnetic field so that the, such that the force is equal to QVB. And we see that because the force is perpendicular to the magnetic field, um, that there is no work being done by the magnetic field upon the charges. Now we can write down, and you've seen this before, we can equate forces, the centripetal force and the magnetic force, mv squared over r equals QVB. We can simplify that as mv over r, equals QB, and we can write down that the radius of the motion of the charge, the gyro radius, is equal to MV over QB. So for a given momentum, MV, a given charge, Q, increasing the magnetic field reduces the bending radius. There is another way I can write that, which is that BR equals P over Q. P is the momentum of the moving charge. Q is the charge. So this is a property of the charge. And B and R together um, show the combination of the effect of the magnetic field and the resulting bending radius. These two terms together are called the beam rigidity. Now there's something else we can do. We can think about that constant acceleration, A, is equal to QVB over M, here the mass of the proton, and that can be written as omega CV, where the frequency of motion, omega C, is equal to V over R equals QB over MP. And what we see here is that the rotational frequency, the rate at which the protons are circulating the magnetic field, 
is independent of the velocity. So this is the cyclotron frequency. Now the cyclotron frequency can be written in one of two ways and you need to spot which way that you're using. It can also be written in terms of the number of revolutions that the proton makes per unit time in a magnetic field is equal to QB over M divided by 2 pi. So if I have a certain cyclo angular cyclotron frequency and I calculate the amount of power that's being emitted, because that's given by the acceleration, the power emitted is equal to Q squared omega C squared V squared over 6 pi epsilon naught C cubed. So the difference between this equation and our previous equation for the Hertzian dipole is that in a magnetic field, the acceleration is constant. So this is the total power emitted by those protons as they are circulating in the magnetic field. It is also the total amount of power emitted by electrons if they have the same velocity. So of course here, in many cases, we're dealing either with protons or electrons because those are the most convenient charges to use. And in that case, I replace Q with E. So let's think about that in a practical situation. So here are my protons circulating, and we normally have much more than uh, one proton. We might have typically one picocoulomb of protons, and you should calculate how many protons that is. So one picocoulomb of protons, we imagine a typical kinetic energy of around 10 MeV. And that is equivalent to a velocity of something like 4.4 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. In a one Tesla magnetic field, in a one Tesla magnetic field, um, omega C is 96 times 10 to the 6 per second, or equivalently, the cyclotron frequency is about 15 megahertz. And remember, the cyclotron frequency is independent of the velocity. So this cyclotron frequency applies for any kinetic energy. We'll see that's not quite true, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But if we calculate the power emitted per proton, it's something like 10 to the minus 22 watts. That's a continuous amount of power, wherever the proton is in its orbit. Per picocoulomb, that is something like 10 to the minus 15 watts per picocoulomb. So despite the fact we have very many protons circulating in our magnetic field, the total power emitted is very, very small. Now that's for one picocoulomb of charge. Imagine I now have a plasma. And here we imagine a plasma immersed within a magnetic field. So just as before in our cyclotron case, each electron in the plasma and each proton in the plasma will emit um, radiation according to the velocity of the charges. And we recall that the typical motion of the electrons, their typical velocity, will be much bigger than the velocity of the ions in the plasma. So this is the power emitted by one of the charges. And of course, if I have a certain number of charges per unit volume, I'll denote that NE, where NE is the number density of the electrons per unit volume, then this value here for the emitted power is something like 6 times 10 to the minus 20 um, NE B0 squared EK given in watts per meter cubed. So I've adjusted these parameters, that should be 10 to the minus 20. I've adjusted these parameters, so this is the kinetic energy in electron volts, to make it a little easier to write down. And B0 is the magnetic field that gives rise to this cyclotron frequency, and NE is the number density of the charges. Now in both cases, we have a plasma in a magnetic field, and a cyclotron, where the protons are moving in a magnetic field, the charges are all moving classically, so when viewed from the side, the charges each look like they're moving backwards and forwards along a line, so they look like a Hertzian dipole. 
So if I were to plot out the power as a function of the emitted frequency, clearly the emission of, of light by these charges occurs only at the cyclotron frequency. If there are imperfections in the magnetic field, then that frequency might vary slightly, so I might see a slight broadening of that, of that um, um, emission uh, uh, line, and I also expect to see harmonics at higher frequencies, 2 omega c, 3 omega c, and so on. And if the, uh, if the field is fairly uniform, the amount of apparent harmonics in that, uh, in that field, and therefore in the emission, will be comparatively small. So let's think of an example of that. Um, imagine a fluorescent lamp. Okay, so we're now moving to the age of having LED lights, but there are still fluorescent lamps in many, many lighting, um, uh, lighting inst installations. Um, they might have a typical kinetic energy for the electrons of something like an electron volt or so. And we imagine taking one of these fluorescent tubes and we place a bar magnet near to it. So that bar magnet might provide a field of something like 0.1 tesla. And knowing that the electron density in that plasma in a typical fluorescent tube might be something like 10 to the 17 per meter cubed, that's a fairly tenuous gas, we can calculate from those two numbers that the power in, in the emitted cyclotron radiation will be something like 6 times 10 to the 5 watts per meter cubed, a fairly small power, but one that can be measured. And the frequency with which the radiation is emitted is something like 2800 megahertz, okay, 2.8 gigahertz. So that is cyclotron radiation. In the next video, we'll talk about synchrotron radiation, which is when the charges become relativistic.